Good morning, folks. Come on in, sit down, we'll get started as we, once again, we're going to peruse heaven. This is a study of heaven we began three weeks ago. Last week we saw heaven as paradise, the paradise of God. You remember the description of paradise? It was an enclosed wooded area with a garden. It was jewel encrusted, the tree of life was there, and... Um, we, we, we learned all about that last week. That's one, only one aspect of heaven. Today, we're going to see a totally different aspect of heaven called the Father's house. So let's look to God in prayer as we begin. Dear Lord, we now come before you thanking you for all that you've given to us. Lord, you've been so good to us. And Lord, we pray today, especially for those that are without jobs, that are looking for work and cannot find them, Lord, it's heavy upon our hearts, Lord. We just pray that you would care for your people in a special way. We claim the promise in your word that the righteous shall never have to beg bread. And Lord, we pray that you would watch over your people and protect them. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the, these days in which we live. Lord, we're living, we believe in the end times and that Jesus' return is close at hand. And Lord, we pray that we might be on fire for you, burning hot, as we seek to make you known to a lost and dying world. Bless this study this morning, Lord. May we see Jesus in his celestial glory, even as Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his glory filled the temple. Lord, might we see you in that vein today, and Lord, may Jesus be the center of all of this. Uh, uh, for the, the next hour, Lord, might he be the center of all that we say and do. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, if you uh, will turn with me, please, in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. 1 Chronicles chapter 28. We're going to see heaven as the Father's house. You know, last week we talked about paradise and how paradise for a time, uh, from the time that Adam and Eve were kicked out of Eden, until the time that Jesus rose from the dead, paradise was in the center of the earth. Remember that? In the nether parts of the earth. You know, I never even thought of it. Never even crossed my mind until one day this past week, all of a sudden it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. What a wonderful verse I could have used and never even thought of about paradise being in the center of the earth. In, John, or in Matthew chapter 12, where the Pharisees ask Jesus for a sign. And Jesus says, There shall be no sign given unto you but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, even so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In the heart of the earth. That's where paradise was all that time. That's Matthew 12, I believe it's verse 40. Okay, so... Um, that's what I should have said last week and didn't. Let's get to this week, the Father's house. In John chapter 14, verse 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. In my Father's house are many mansions. Here is a reference to his Father's house. And he said, In this house are many mansions. Now that word mansion is the Greek word M-O-N-E, mon. And the word, the English word mansion that, it, that, from, that it's translated into, mansion is a word that entered into the English language in the 13th century. And so the, um, uh, the translators translated that mansion. Now some of the earlier translations, in fact the very first, the very first English translation of the Bible was the Wycliffe translation back in 1380. And he translated that word dwelling places. In my father's house are many dwelling places. And that is exactly what it means. And then some of the later, uh, or not later, but more ancient uh, English translations. We have the Tyndale translation in 1526. It was translated, in my father's house are many mansions. The Matthews uh, translation in 1530, which was an updating of the Tyndale translation said, in my father's house are many mansions. In the 
1899 Young's Literal Translation. It, is, it reads, in my father's house are many mansions. And in the uh, 1582 Reims Translation, that's a Catholic, Roman Catholic translation. It reads, in my father's house are many mansions. Then we have in 1611, the King James Version, and in 1979, the New King James Version. In all of these, it is translated mansions. And in, go, we, we go back to 1599, the Old Geneva Translation, it is translated dwelling places. That's almost the way uh, Wycliffe translated it back in 1380. In my father's house, are many dwellings, uh, Wycliffe said. The Geneva translation is, in my father's house are many dwelling places. And this word, uh, dwelling places, the, um, it, it means there uh, a, 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 large, a large place, a large dwelling place there. In 1971, the NIV came out and they translated it rooms, and that really misses the whole thing. And then, of course, in 2003, the mess, Actually, it's the message, but it's, I call it the mess because it's, it, it should never even be called a Bible. I just, it just boggles my mind that there are preachers, right, this morning standing up in their pulpits in this country and preaching out of that mess. is just unbelievable. It's blasphemous. But he totally misses it. He says, in my father's house, there's plenty of rooms. I mean, that just, it, do, it doesn't car, uh, carry with it uh, the, at all. Now, this word moan, M-O-N-E, which is translated mansion, um, it has more, more to it than that, a more meaning to it than that. It means a permanent abiding place, a permanent abiding place. And so, you know, we believe in eternal security down here. Well, there's also eternal security up there. It's, an, it's a permanent permanent um, abiding place. Now in um, John chapter 14 and verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now that word abode is the same identical word, M-O-N-E, moan, which is translated mansion. So you could read that, we will come and make our, our, our mansion, our dwelling place, with him. So the, um, that word is only found twice in the whole Bible. Both times it's found in John chapter 14. The one time here in verse 23 it's translated abode and in verse 2 it's translated mansion. And we're going to see that mansion is a the most probably the most accurate way that you could translate that word. I've heard many people uh, ridicule the Bible, say, oh, well, that doesn't mean mansion. Well, no, it doesn't mean mansion in, in the sense that we use the word mansion today. The English language has changed some. When we think of a mansion today, we think of a big palatial type home that some uh, uh, rich people dwell in, and that's not exactly true. The word mansion comes from the word manor. And back in those days, the English feudal system, they had the lord of the manor. And the lord of the manor, he ruled everything. Was, you know, there was serfdom back in those days. And uh, on his property, <coughs> uh, separate from the manor, <coughs> pardon me, the manor, there were other homes where uh, some of his more important servants dwelled. They were called mansions. And so when Jesus speaks these words, in my father's house are many mansions, that was the thought that is, is the translators thought to convey here, because that's in the day in which they lived, that's, that's how a mansion was, was viewed. So, in my father's house are many mansions, which means an abode or an abiding place. So the first thing we see about the father's house is that it is an abiding place. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye shall be also. And so the, um, the thought behind this word mansion here is a place, a, an abiding place, 
a, uh, a, a beautiful place. We're, we're going to see as we see some descriptions of it. And so it's um, uh, the, the, the Father's house is, is a beautiful aspect of what we're going to see and where we're going to live when we get to heaven. In Luke chapter 16, we find out that hell also is a place. In Luke 16, 28, the rich man in hell says, I have five brethren. He says, pray that he may testify unto them, lest they come also to this place of torment. This place of torment, that's hell. Well, here's another place prepared by Jesus. I go to prepare a place for you. It's an abiding place, a place of eternal bliss and a celestial beauty. So, all right, so the first thing we see about it here is that it is, um, it is a, um, an abiding place. It's called a mansion. The second thing we're, we see about this is concerning the, both the tabernacle and then later on the temple. In John chapter 2 and verse 16, he said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Here he again talks about my father's house and he's talking here about the temple. He says, you've made my father's house a house of merchandises. He upbraids the money changers and the sellers of animals there. Now, Jesus cleansed the temple another time also. And in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 13, he says, my father's house shall be a house of prayer. A house of prayer. Now, where did, where did that come from? Well, if you'll turn with me, please. Hold your finger in First Chronicles, but turn with me, please, to the book of Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. This is, this is an important verse telling us about the Father's house, which we're going to tie it all in together here. Isaiah chapter 56 and uh, verse 7. Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 7. We read there, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, that's Mount Zion, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Remember Jesus said to the money changers, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. It says, make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted unto mine altar. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer. And now notice the last three words, for all people. When Jesus quoted that, he left off those last three words because he was talking specifically to the Jews. But when Isaiah wrote this, the overall picture is it will be a house of prayer for all people. So the Father's house here is going to be seen as an adoration place, an adoration place where God is to be adored. So first of all, it's an abiding place. And secondly, it is an adoration place. Now, the Father's house on earth was called first the tabernacle and secondly the temple. Now, in Exodus, notice on your note sheets, Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9. It says, God says, let them make me a sanctuary. He's talking about the tabernacle here. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof. God gave Moses a blueprint of what the tabernacle was supposed to be like. He gave him an actual blueprint. He says, see that you make everything according after the pattern. An architect draws up blueprints I don't know if they still call them blueprints or not. They, I think they just call them prints now. But draws up the prints, and then the builder has to make it exactly like the architect drew it. Well, God is the architect of his house. And Moses, in this case, was the builder. Now, after that, when they uh, built the temple, it was Solomon who was the builder. But the same thing holds true here. Now, if you look down at the bottom of the page there, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. The shadow of heavenly things. Those blueprints that God gave first to Moses and then to, to uh, Solomon, those blueprints 
were a shadow or a type of God's house, the Father's house in heaven. So if we study God's earthly house, we will have a greater understanding of what the heavenly house is going to look like. And it's well that we do because we're going to be dwelling in that heavenly house. In my Father's house are many mansions and I go and prepare a place for you. So we at least, you know, we're going to move into a new place. You, you'd like to look at it first, right? <laughs> Imagine moving into a place sight unseen or buying a house and not even looking at it. Well, we ought to look at it. We're going to, look, going to spend eternity in it. And so if we study the earthly house, we will see more and more uh, uh, truth of what the heavenly house is going to be like. Now, continuing to read in Hebrews 8, 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern. Here it is again. The pattern, the blueprint, showed to thee in the mount. See that you make all these things according to the blueprint. So when Moses made the tabernacle, God was the architect. He drew them up. And he says, this is a shadow or a type or a picture or figuratively, this is what my house in heaven looks like. Now, having said that, you got your Bibles open to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. We are going to look at the temple because after <coughs> Israel entered into their land, they ceased using the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent that they folded up and took down every night and set up again, uh, took down every morning and then set up again at night. They built a temple, which was a permanent place. And the word mansion, you remember, means a permanent abiding place. So this is not a tent anymore. It's a permanent abiding place. Now, if you have a pen or pencil or marker or something, um, in verse 11, 1 Chronicles 28, verse 11, David gave to Solomon, his son, the pattern. Just underline that, the pattern. Here's the pattern or the blueprint again. Then look at verse 12. And the pattern. Here it is again, second time it's used, the pattern. Look down at verse 18. And for the altar of incense, refined gold by weight and gold for the pattern. Third time it's used. And then the fourth time is in verse 19. All this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by the hand upon me, even all the works of this pattern. Four times in 1 Chronicles 28, when it talks about building the temple, it is according to this pattern. The architect was God. He drew up the prince he, and he, he designed it. And Jesus said, in my father's house, our many mansions. Here's where we're going to live. And he says, you've got to follow the pattern because it's a pattern of the heavenly house, which is uh, was up in heaven with God. Now, before we get into what we want to see here, um, let's focus on verse 19 here. This, this, is, uh, this is great. All this said David, the Lord made me understand. And look at the next two words. In writing by his hand. In writing, God actually wrote this out. He drew up on paper, well they didn't have paper, but whatever they used, parchment or, or vellum or whatever they used, they, he says he, he made me to understand in writing by his hand. Okay, now who was this? Look over at verse 11. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 12, verse 12. And the pattern of all that he had made by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit gave to David in writing the whole blueprint of the house of God, which was a parallel of the heavenly house up there in heaven of the, uh, the Father's house in heaven. Second Peter chapter one, verse 21 says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The prophecy came not in ancient time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God 
wrote the word of God. This is his work in writing, just like he gave to David there in writing the pattern of the house of God. So this is an infallible blueprint of what the house in heaven is going to look like. David had it in writing. It was written by the Holy Spirit. Now, what is it actually going to look like? We have seen that the Father's house is an abiding place. We have seen that the Father's house is an adoration place. And now we're going to see that the Father's house is an awesome place. Starting with verse 11. Then David gave to Solomon, his son, the pattern. Now, if you want to underline all that follows here, you can. Here's what was included in that blueprint. First of all, the porch. The porch. Here's the first thing, the porch. So, the father's house is going to have a porch. Do you like to sit in the porch, out in the porch? I love to sit out on the porch. I love being outside, not in this weather, but <laughs> in the summertime. I love being outside. You know, I love being outside. I hired Vern <laughs> to come over and build me a back porch, all screened in. I can sit out there in warm weather, Barney and me, my little dog. <laughs> and we sit out there. I study the Word of God. I've sat out there, prepared lessons out there, prepared messages out there. I love being outside. God's house is going to have a porch to sit on. Then secondly, it says houses. Look at verse 11 again. It says the pattern of the porch and, and of the houses, plural. What are those houses? Here's the mansions. In my father's house are many mansions, individual homes. In my father's house. You know that the old, um, the old hymn, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop, doesn't, it, it, it's, it's partly true. Um, it's not a mansion as we think of a mansion. It's part of the Father's house. In my Father's house, the scripture says. Not apart from it, but in my Father's house are many mansions. Well, the earthly Father's house had the mansions or the houses thereof. And then it goes on and says, and the treasuries. The treasuries. Now, I don't know what we need treasuries for in heaven. <coughs> Pardon me. In heaven, the streets are made out of pure gold and the and the walls are encrusted with jewels and, the, and uh, the gates are made out of pearls. And, and I don't think we use money up there, but there's going to be treasuries. That they, they're going to have some kind of a use in the house of God. In fact, there's three different treasuries in the house of God, which we shall see. And then it goes on and look at the next one, the upper chambers, which means they're on the, the second story. The second story is going to have a, a, a second story on it, at least a second story, maybe more. Maybe it'll be a high rise. But at any rate, it, it's, going to, um, it's going to have more than one floor. And um, then it talks about the inner parlors. The inner parlors. Notice that's plural, parlors. It's going to be a lot of parlors to sit in. A lot of places, the living room, the and family room, uh, the great room, as they call it. Uh, all of that is part of the master's, uh, of the father's house. And then the end of verse 11, it says, and the place of the mercy seat. The place of the mercy seat. This is God's presence himself, the very presence of God. God met uh, the high priest on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is in heaven. These people running around here, you know, the Indiana Jones bunch running around looking for the Ark of the Covenant where they're looking, it's a futile search because it's been up in heaven for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's the mercy seat, that's the presence of God. And we're gonna be dwelling in the presence of God in his house. And then after that, it goes on and tells us here, uh, in verse 12, and the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit, the courts of the house. And here again, this is, this is plural here, the courts. It would be a lot of courts uh, to dwell in. And um, then of all the chambers round about. The chambers round, the chambers round about it. Now that word chambers, I just want to throw this little dig in. That word chambers means rooms. And it's a totally different word than the word mansions. 
Now, in the Father's house, there's going to be many rooms, like the NIV says. There's going to be many rooms, but much more. We're not going to be dwelling, per se, in those rooms. I mean, we may uh, use them, we may visit them, but we're, we each have our own mansion or dwelling place uh, as represented by the houses there, the mansions that, uh, that are in the Father's house. So there's going to be chambers round about it. And then we read again of the treasuries of the house of God. This is the second time. And number 10, the treasuries of the dedicated things. So it's three rooms dedicated to treasures, God's treasures. You know, it says in the book of Malachi that God is going to make up his jewels. And he's not talking about diamonds, topaz, rubies, emeralds. He's talking about people. Make up his jewels. So you can speculate on what that, those tre uh, uh, rooms that are used for his treasury may, may or may not be. But at any rate, this is, a, this is an awesome place. Ten different things. They're connected with the Father's house that we will have access to. Now going to the next page, Israel forsook the Lord. And Jesus told them in Matthew 23, verse 37 and 38, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. They would not come to him. And so he says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. The earthly replica of God's house was destroyed in 70 AD. And the, so the earthly replica no longer exists. But that's all it was, was an earthly replica replica the, the the father's house is there intact in heaven it's a permanent abiding place all right then the fourth thing we're going to see is the father's house in parables and if you'll turn please to uh, the gospel of luke luke chapter 15 and jesus gives a parable about the father's house and we're going to see now that this is an abundant place it's an abiding place and it is if i can rem remember them all it is an abiding place it's an adoration place it's an awesome place and it is also an abundant place the story here is of the prodigal son and he goes to the father he says give me my inheritance and the father sends him off and he goes and he he wastes it all he winds up in a pig pen in a uh, in a far off country uh, and he's eating the husks and the Bible says we'll pick the story up in verse 17 it says when he came to himself he began to realize it says he said to himself how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger he begins to think of his father's house and he says in my father's house there is bread enough to spare. There's not going to be any hunger in heaven. Did you know that two-thirds of the world goes to bed every night hungry? Hunger is a reality of life. We don't have much of that in America, but in the rest of the world, hunger is a way of life in a lot of places. Famines are a way of life in a lot of places. It's just devastating. You see pictures of little brown skinned babies, just nothing but skin stretched over their bones and their eyes bulging out. It's from hunger. And this is so prevalent in the world today. There's no hunger in heaven. He says there is bread enough to spare. And here, here the, uh, the son was perishing with hunger. He said, but in my father's house, there's bread enough to spare. And then secondly, uh, he goes home, and, and what do we find in the father's house? In verse 22, we read, But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. Apparently he had been barefoot and dwelling in rags, and if he'd had any rings or jewelry, he probably had sold them or pawned them long before. And he comes into the father's house, and he has now the best of robes, 
Notice what it says, the best of robes. He's given clothing like we've, we haven't seen before and a ring on his hand and, and shoes on his feet. All of his needs are met here in the Father's house. There's nothing lacking in the Father's house. And then in verse 23, the Father says, bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. The fatted calf was used for special occasions. And here the Father says, bring forth the fatted calf. My son has come home. And so this was a time of, of luxuriant living and being merry. There was a joyful, heaven's gonna be a joyful place. A lot of people be very unhappy in heaven. Lost people, they wouldn't be happy up there. And you, and you couldn't trust them up there anyways. They'd be digging up the uh, gold bricks out of the street if they could, or, or the jewels out of the, out of the wall. Uh, but they wouldn't be happy up there, the worshiping God and, and uh, serving God and, and being in a totally Christian environment. You know, the most wonderful thing on earth is Christian fellowship, fellowshipping with other Christians. And heaven's going to, we're going to see in just a moment, heaven is a place of, of, of wonderful Christian fellowship as well. But lost people don't care for Christian fellowship. I remember years ago, before I was saved and then a short while after I was saved, I didn't give a rip for Christian fellowship. They didn't do things like I like to do. And they didn't like to do what I wanted to do. And I didn't like doing some of the things they wanted to do. But as I began to, as I got saved and began to grow in the Lord, I thought, man, Christian fellowship's a wonderful thing. I didn't get rid of any of my old friends. They just disappeared. And I, one day I thought to myself, you know what? Those Christians that I don't care, didn't care to be with, that's the only people I am <laughs> being with now. And I didn't even realize it. One day it just woke up and, well, all my friends are, are Christians. These are the only people I run with. These are the only people I'm, I'm hanging around with anymore. What a wonderful thing, Christian fellowship. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So anyways, uh, he says, we'll eat and be merry. And then we read in the, um, in the 24th verse, the father says, for this my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found, and they begin to be merry. There it is again, the 32nd verse, it was meet that we should make merry and be glad. And so there's a, heaven's gonna be a joyous place. It's not gonna be where you sit around and mope and, and pray and uh, look solemn and dignified and so forth. Now, not only is there gonna be merriment in heaven, but now don't, don't tell a lot of Baptists this, but in Luke 15, 25, there's going to be music and dancing. <laughs> That's what it says. Now, the dancing is not what we consider dancing today. Um, dancing, the, the Jewish concept of dancing was totally different. It wasn't men with women and so forth. It was a different thing altogether. But it was a time of merriment. You ever gone to a Jewish wedding? You say, who, who dances with who? Well, there's all the men dancing, and then you see all the women dancing and, and, and so forth. But it was a time of music and merriment. I wonder what kind of music they're going to have. <laughs> wonder what, kind, what the music's going to be like. Well, we won't even speculate on that. And then here's what else is going to be up there in heaven. Friends. In verse 29, here's the, the older brother. <clears throat> He's mad. And he's, he's, he's out there in the field pouting. He, he says, uh, uh, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, the fatted calf, that I might make merry with my friends. He's implying here that the prodigal son's friends were there with him. And you know what? In heaven, our friends are going to be there with us. If you don't have a lot of Christian friends, you'd better get some because that's who you're going to be spending eternity with. with our, these are our friends. The sweetest thing, the side of heaven, is Christian fellowship. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Now, it even goes beyond that. Not only are we going to be there with our friends, but better than that. Verse 32, the father says to the, the, the other brother, the older brother, 
It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and was found. Thy brother. We're going to be brothers and sisters in heaven, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, born of the Holy Spirit, the born-again, blood-washed, redeemed saints of God. That's who our fellowship is going to be with, brothers and sisters in Christ. So this is the Father's house, and it is an abund abundant place. Everything that we need, more than that, everything that we want is going to be met there in the Father's house. Now moving on, we see the Father's house in heaven in John 14. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. In John 20, uh, Jesus meets with Mary after his resurrection. And he saith unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. I'm not yet ascended to my Father. Jesus had to go up. He had to take the blood that was shed at Calvary. And when he rose from the dead, he had to take the blood up to heaven. He had to take it into the Father's house that it might be brought to the mercy seat in the Father's house. And when the blood was applied, that was sufficient to wash away the sins of the world of each and every one that, that put their trust in him. So here is the um, here is the, uh, the blood being applied there. Jesus said, I have to ascend to my father. I got to go into my father's house and uh, deliver the blood here. Well, he said in John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. Why did he say many? There's an obvious answer. Look at Hebrews 2.10 right in, um, on your note sheets there. Hebrews 2.10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things to bring many sons unto glory. He said in my father's house are many mansions because he's going to bring many sons unto glory. So it's not going to be overcrowded. There's going to be a dwelling place, a mansion for each and every one. You're not going to have to live with some relatives or have some relatives living with you. <laughs> None of that stuff going on. It's going to be many mansions for many sons that have been brought into glory. So what is heaven here? It's an actual place. It's a real place. It's genuine. And in Amos 4.12, Amos says, prepare to meet thy God. God says, you have got to prepare to meet me. Prepare to meet thy God. Why? Because God has prepared and is preparing a place for each and every one of us. Now, what has Jesus prepared for us? Right down at the bottom of the page. What has Jesus prepared? Number one, he's prepared a place. I go to prepare a place for you. A mansion in glory. Number two, a table. Remember what it said about the Father's house? There is uh, the, no, no uh, uh, we have bread to spare. Well, in Psalm 23, 5, thou preparest a table before me. God's going to feed us. He's going to lead us and feed us. And then thirdly, he's prepared a kingdom for us to dwell in. Psalm 103, verse 19, the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, his throne in the heavens. And then, fourthly, he's prepared heaven also. Remember, we learned last time that man was not made for heaven, and so God has to prepare heaven for us. And in Proverbs 8, 27, it says, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. This is Jesus, the, God's, the voice of God's wisdom. First Corinthians says that Jesus is unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And he, he is seen as wisdom here. And as wisdom, he says, uh, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. Then going to the next page, he's prepared a city. Hebrews eleven sixteen. Now they desire a better country that is a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. He hath prepared for them a city. Next week. When we study the, the uh, heaven, we're going to see the city. We've seen, uh, we've seen the, um, 
uh, the first part here as paradise, and we're seeing it today as the Father's house. And next week we're going to see the city. Well, Hebrews eleven sixteen says he's prepared for us a city. And if you notice in that verse, it's heavenly. It says they desire a better country that is a heavenly, a heavenly city prepared for us. And then we read 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And then number seven, he's prepared for us a body. We're not going to have to spend eternity in these old bodies because they're dying, they're aging, uh, they're corruptible. And secondly, we're not going to have to spend eternity as a spirit floating around. He's prepared for us a body. Now, first of all, in Hebrews 10, notice right at the end of the verse, but a body hast thou prepared me. This is Jesus God prepared for Jesus a body, a resurrection body, a uh, immortal body, all right? Okay, well, you say that's Jesus, right, that's Jesus. But then right under that, look at Philippians 3.21. It says, who shall change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. We're going to have a body just like Jesus' resurrection body which means it'll be a body that will not know pain, it will not know disease or sickness, it will not experience aging. Going to have a body just like his body. Then number eight, he's prepared a people, Luke 1, 17, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. We are a people prepared by God. He has prepared us and prepared a place for us. And then finally, the bride, the church, is the bride of Christ. And in Revelation chapter 21, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, out of heaven, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Israel, uh, um, in, in, when they had a wedding in Israel, the bridegroom had to go ahead and get the house ready. And then he married the bride. He had the house all ready. Then he could marry the bride and he would take her into his house. Well, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And so the wedding takes place. The marriage supper of the lamb or the, the church, the bride of Christ is united to Christ. He, we are united to him and he takes us to the place prepared for us in his father's house, the many mansions that are there. Please turn with me back to the book of Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse four, this is a great verse. Isaiah 64, four says, for since the beginning of the world, Men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. You cannot even imagine what God has prepared. We can learn all these things about heaven, and then over, above, and beyond all of that, we cannot even imagine what God has prepared for each and every and for each and every one of us, and so um, we find here that uh, that it is uh, an, an actual it's an actual place it's a real place prepared by God. Now God had a lot to prepare. Uh, he prepared all these things. We saw that because if you remember, man was not made for heaven. Man was made for earth. Notice in your notes, it's Genesis two seven. The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. The word man, the Hebrew word for man is Adam, A-D-A-M. Now Adam is a proper name, but it is also the Hebrew word for man. And look at the word ground, A-D-A-M and then A-H on the end of it, Adama. So you read Genesis 2-7 in Hebrew, it would read, and the Lord God formed Adam from the dust of the Adama. Man was made 
from the earth and he was made for the earth. That was the original intent of God until sin messed that up. And so when God decided to take the redeemed of mankind to heaven, he has to prepare heaven and, and, uh, and, and to make, heaven, uh, make, uh, make man fit for heaven and make heaven fit for man. Well, notice in, down at the bottom there, Luke 9, 62, Jesus saith unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He's not fit. He wouldn't fit into God's kingdom. He wouldn't fit. The believers in Christ, we fit together in, in forming God's house. And then on the next page, Isaiah 4, 6, or I'm sorry, Ephesians 4, 16, here we see the church is a body. And we read the same thing, from whom the whole body fitly, here's that word again, fitly joined together. In Genesis chapter 1, God prepared earth for man. And in John chapter 14, God is preparing heaven for man. So he prepared earth for man, now he's preparing heaven for man. And he said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And we're going to see that this is an affluent place. Psalm 36, 8. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. Abundantly satisfied. It's going to be total, complete satisfaction. We're, we can be reasonably satisfied, but there's still something longing, something missing in most of our lives. We have a yearning to know God, to be with God. The Apostle Paul experienced this. But in heaven, there's going to be an abundantly satisfaction with the fatness of his house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. It's going to be a wonderful place. Psalm 65, 4, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. That's up in heaven. Remember the, the house of God has courts. Remember that? Okay, he's going, we're going to dwell in thy courts. And we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. There's not going to be any, any longing, any uh, part of us not satisfied. We'll be totally satisfied with, uh, uh, to, to do that. Well, uh, Paul said in Philippians 121, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's quite a statement. And then he said in Philippians 123, he says, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, he said, I'm willing to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Three times Paul said, I'd rather be in heaven than, than down here. And um, uh, when we do die and go to heaven, uh, we're going to see that heaven is also an, an angelic place. In Luke 16, when the beggar Lazarus died, we read, it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now that was in paradise. That was in the center of the earth. We talked about last week. But I have to believe that the same thing holds true today, that when our soul of a saved person dies, he is given an angelic escort into heaven. Heaven's much farther away than the center of the earth. And just imagine this huge universe that God has built at the time of death when the soul leaves the body. And where does it go? You know, we look around this huge universe. Well, where do we go? Well, I believe that when we die, or just before we die, there's angels standing there waiting. And when the soul leaves the body, one angel will grab one arm and the other the other arm and Say, okay, it's your time, and up to glory we go. It's an angelic place. We read in the um, book of, of Hebrews that it is appointed unto man once to die. It's an appointment, and that appointment was made by God. And these angels, they know when that appointment is. God tells them, okay, here's uh, old brother so-and-so. It's his appointed time. Go on down there to earth and escort him back to heaven. So it's an angelic es escort. And in the book of Revelation, and again in the book of Daniel, we are told that the angels of God are in the millions in heaven. So it's an angelic place. 
So here is, um, here we see, um, here's what heaven is, or, or more properly, here's what the Father's house is. It's an abiding place, John 14, 2. It's an adoration place, Matthew 21, 13. It's an awesome place, 1 Chronicles 28. It's an abundant place, Luke chapter 15. It's an actual place, Isaiah 64. It's an affluent place, Psalm 36 and Psalm 65. And it's an angelic place, Luke chapter 16. Now, just before we close, I'd like you to turn quickly to the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, and um, this is where Paul is preaching. It's near, he's nearing the end of his uh, ministry there just before he departs for Rome. And in A Acts chapter 20, starting with verse 9, Paul is preaching, and look at verse 9. There sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. Did you ever fall asleep in church? So did Eutychus. Yeah. He fell into a deep sleep, and as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft. He said, three lofts up there, he falls down. He fell from the third loft and was taken up dead. Well, that's what he gets for falling asleep in church. Well, anyways, verse 10, Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourself, for his life is with him. And when he therefore was come up again, and he's restored to life. Uh, let's use a little sanctified speculation here now about Eutychus. How long did it take from the time he landed on the ground and died? Apparently he died immediately. And from the time that, that Paul got down there to, to revive him, bring him back again. Probably, and this is just speculation, but probably about 10 minutes. Okay. So what happened to Eutychus during those 10 minutes? During that 10 minutes? Well, first of all, in the twinkling of an eye, because that's how long it takes to get for our souls to, to leave the earth and get to heaven in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye. So number one, in the um, twinkling of an eye. Number two, with an angelic escort, he's taken up to heaven. Number three, he goes through the pearly gates. Number four, he walks down the streets that are made of gold. Number five, he notices that there's no pain no more. That probably, he probably messed himself up pretty good when he fell. Probably had a lot of uh, aches and, and bruises when, when he was revived, but uh, there's no pain there. And he looks and he sees there's some of his loved ones that have gone on before. He sees them up there. Number seven, he, he sees his mansion that he's going to dwell in for all eternity. Uh, number eight, he experiences paradise, that enclosed wooden uh, garden paradise up there. And then all of a sudden, sorry, Eutychus, <laughs> you got to go back. <laughs> you got to go back, Eutychus, sorry. You're going to get restored to life again. You're going to have some aches and pains because you had quite a fall. And that mortal body of yours is going to have to die again. And before that happens, you're going to experience sickness. Before that happens, you're going to experience pain. You're going to experience sorrow. You're going to experience the, the, the uh, experience of growing old, aging, and all of that. Poor Eutychus. <laughs> For about 10 minutes, he saw all of what heaven was going to be like. And I think that Eutychus could probably agree with Paul in Philippians 1.21 to die is gain. In Philippians 1.23, would have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, be willing to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Well, that brings us to the close of the Father's house. And next week, we're going to see the city. And so this is another aspect of heaven, the, the heavenly Jerusalem. Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. If you need the last two weeks note sheets, they're laying up here on the front. Dear Lord, now dismiss us with your blessing. We thank you, Lord, for these insights into heaven. And Lord, we uh, can truly say with the Apostle Paul, we desire to be with Christ, which is far better. Now bless us as we leave this place. And until that time comes when it is our time, when our appointment is due to be ushered into your presence and into your house, Lord, we pray that we might be found faithful and busy serving you 
till, till, till death us do part. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.